Well, folks, the attempts to take down Donald Trump are very, very real, and they are having significant consequences for the body politic. They're coming from nearly every major institution in the United States, from our universities to the media, from academia to the judiciary, as we'll talk about. It's happening everywhere. And the real question is why? Is this really about Donald Trump as a person? Is it really about Donald Trump with all of his myriad foibles and mistakes and crazinesses? Or is it about something broader? I will contend that it's about something broader, that the elite institutions in our society have basically decided that if anyone remotely right wing were to ever enter the presidency again, it would be an existential threat to their vision of a utopian future for the United States. The reason I say this is because this weekend marked President's Day. We have an entire episode of facts up at YouTube that you can view right now about the worst president of all time. And what you'll see in our list is that it goes all the way back and all the way forward. And it really tries to take a look at what people did while they were president and the impact of those things while they were president. And sometimes, as with Jimmy Carter, in their post-presidency. But historians every year, there's always a big story about the presidential rankings, the overall presidential greatness rankings from the American Political Science Association. And what this list does is it demonstrates who they think was the best and who they think was the worst. Obviously, they have Trump in last place. Of course, of course. And you would assume that they would. But that doesn't really answer the question as to whether they just hate Trump or whether there is something broader going on. To truly understand how much the elite institutions hate Trump and really hate the right wing, you have to understand that it's not just that they hate Trump. It's that they despise anyone who smacks in any way of being on the right in the United States. And Trump is just the apotheosis of all of those things. He's just the apex of all the things that they hate because they are able to stack up all of those myriad crazinesses and foibles of Donald Trump on top of all the other things that they hate about Republicans. So if you look at their list, their list is stacked top to bottom with Democrats. Every Republican is downgraded significantly. Every Democrat is upgraded significantly. So here is the list from the American Political Science Association of their top presidents. They have Abraham Lincoln at number one, obviously consensus number one pick. Now, usual consensus pick is Abraham Lincoln number one and George Washington number two. Sometimes you see the other way, George Washington number one and Abraham Lincoln number two. But those are always the top two, but not for the American Political Science Association. They have Lincoln at number one, and then they have Franklin Delano Roosevelt at number two, which is pretty astonishing considering that Franklin Delano Roosevelt presided over the Great Depression. He probably lengthened it by nearly a decade with his garbage economic policies. Franklin Delano Roosevelt initiated many of the vast government overspending programs that have crippled America and created a vast welfare state that has led to a $34 trillion national debt. In other words, there are some good things that FDR did, like, for example, his leadership during World War II. Even that, even that was plagued by some bad leadership decisions, particularly with regard to, say, the Yalta Agreement, which ceded all of Eastern Europe to the Soviets. FDR had a bizarre soft spot for Stalin. In any case, putting him number two above George Washington is the tell, but it doesn't end there. They put Teddy Roosevelt at number four. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was a progressive. Teddy Roosevelt was a believer in the power of big government, even though he was a Republican. Again, the Republican and Democratic parties have shifted identity somewhat over the course of time. They put Thomas Jefferson at number five, Harry Truman at number six, and Barack Obama at number seven. There is no possible way to say that Barack Obama is the seventh best president of all time the seventh greatest president of all time, clocking in above Dwight D. Eisenhower, James Madison, John Adams, Ronald Reagan, and everyone else. That's insane. Barack Obama was a terrible president. Barack Obama wildly exacerbated racial divisions in the United States of America by every available polling statistic. He presided over the complete dissolution of American power around the world. He downgraded the American military. He wrecked us in the foreign sphere. And domestically, he polarized America like no president of my lifetime, bar none. Not just on issues of race, but also on issues of culture, on issues of, say, sexual mores. We moved from a country where in 2008, Barack Obama campaigned as a proponent of traditional marriage to by the time he left office, open discussions about whether men are women. That is what Barack Obama did, besides presiding over the worst recovery from a serious economic recession in American history, the slowest recovery in American history. And he spent more money than literally all prior presidents combined did Barack Obama. They have him at number seven on this list. And then they have LBJ, who initiated the Great Society programs that have spent probably $13 trillion on anti-poverty programs to leave almost precisely the same percentage of Americans in poverty. They have him ranked at number nine. The guy who lost the Vietnam War and got us involved in it in the first place. The guy who 
completely rewrote the constitutional relationship between the government and the private American citizen. That guy is at number nine. Bill Clinton is at number 12, as though Joe Biden is at number 14 on this list from the American Political Science Association. How in the world is Joe Biden ranked number 14? Ronald Reagan is ranked number 16. So Ronald Reagan, who led the most booming economic recovery in modern American history in the 1980s, and also created the groundwork for defeating the Soviet Union, that guy is ranked. That guy is ranked at number 16, and Joe Biden is ranked at number 14 by these people. Woodrow Wilson, the worst president of all time, a vicious racist who led us into World War I, who then created the system that led us into World War II, who jailed his political opponents for sedition. Woodrow Wilson, a truly horrifying, who created the bureaucratic state, the worst president of all time, they have that guy ranked above Ronald Reagan. Okay, the reason that I'm reading this is because you have to understand the framework by which our elite institutions work. And because of that framework, they are led into both a bizarre delusion that they can't possibly lose to somebody like Donald Trump. And also, they are led to believe that they can do anything they want to stop Donald Trump. Because after all, if you have the 14th greatest president of all time, according to these people, running against literally the worst president of all time, well, I mean, what can't you do to stop that president of the United States? What can't you do to stop Donald Trump? We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, do you know what big tech and big government have in common? They both would like to silence dissenting voices into submission. If you talk about something they don't like on social media, well, good chance your post will be flagged by a content moderator. You might end up on some sort of government watch list. To fight back against having your voice censored by both big tech and big government, I recommend ExpressVPN. The problem with big tech is that not only do they attempt to censor you, they also track what you do online. They track what you're searching for, the videos you watch, everything you click. They can then match your activity to your true identity using your device's unique IP address. When I use ExpressVPN, they can't see my IP address at all. My identity is anonymized by a secure VPN server. Plus, ExpressVPN encrypts 100% of my internet data for protection from hackers and eavesdroppers. ExpressVPN is by far the best VPN I've tried. It is the VPN rated number one by Business Insider and countless other tech publications. What I love most about ExpressVPN, super easy to use. The app has one button, you tap it, you're protected. It's that simple. So stop letting your voice be censored. Defend your rights and protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben to get three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben. So in the realm of delusion, Nate Silver has been taking it directly on the chin over the weekend because, he, because the poll analyst put up a piece pointing out that Joe Biden is extremely vulnerable in his reelect effort. He says, quote, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have told you that Joe Biden was a reasonably clear favorite in the event of a rematch against Donald Trump. Not an overwhelming favorite, mind you, but perhaps a 65-35 favorite. The case for Biden seemed obvious enough. Incumbents win re-election more often than not. And of course, Biden beat Trump in 2020. Democrats were coming off a relatively strong midterm. So I don't begrudge people who took their time to realize that Biden's re-election would be a heavy lift. The first time my internal needle began to shift was in late summer when Biden's approval numbers remained poor, even as the economy was improving. And it was becoming more apparent that his advanced age was an enormous problem for voters and one Democrats weren't going to be able to spin away. Since then, Biden's situation has become considerably worse. If he were 10 years younger, he might still be a 65-35 favorite, says Nate Silver. But if his campaign is substantially encumbered by his age, he's probably now the underdog. And he says, you guys need to stop being delusional. And he goes through the stats and he points out that Joe Biden has a real problem in his reelect effort, which is why you are seeing people ranging from Nate Silver to Ezra Klein, neither of whom is exactly a Republican, calling for Joe Biden to step aside. And he's getting walloped by the left today because it is not possible for Joe Biden to lose. That would simply be impossible. This is why they're still trotting out Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, to claim that Joe Biden is all mentally well when we can clearly see that he is not. Here's Amy Klobuchar over the weekend. I was on uh, Air Force One with the president going from Minnesota to uh, Wisconsin for going from Washington, D.C. to Wisconsin for an infrastructure project. And I was with the president for over an hour and talked about so many things, domestic, international. He was focused. His recall was good. It was the same experience that my colleagues had who met with him for hours, Democrats and Republicans, about the Mideast only a few weeks ago. So he's totally fine, according to Amy Klobuchar. And they're going to continue to maintain this because, again, if you believe that Joe Biden is the 14th greatest president of all time and that Barack Obama was number seven, then how is it possible for Joe Biden to lose to Donald Trump? But Team Biden does realize that there are some bad polling numbers for him. And so he is now going to try to pull off a reset, according to Axios. They see his State of the Union address as a big public reset moment. So good luck with that. I've seen a lot of State of the Unions over my time watching politics, which is 
several decades at this point. And let me just say, there has never been a state of the union that acted as an actual reset for a president. There have been good ones and there have been bad ones. It rarely acts as a signal moment. Okay, but they're going to try to relaunch Joe Biden. Good luck with that. They're launching the BlackBerry again into the middle of the iPhone market. According to Axios, many top Democrats are convinced that if the election were held today, Joe Biden would lose a rematch with former President Trump. Biden's State of the Union address is probably going to feature some interesting moves, including, for example, an attempt to change the debate with regard to immigration. Joe Biden is now considering an executive order on immigration that would effectively try to prevent more mass immigration into the United States. He's going to do this just before the election and attempt to take the issue off the table. Now, there's a pretty significant problem with that, which is, of course, that is a tacit admission that he could have done that all along. But again, Joe Biden is realizing that he is vulnerable. And so are most Democrats, even though they really don't want to believe it. And again, because this is a battle of good versus evil, according to Democrats, that means it's time to break a glass in case of emergency. The emergency is here and they are now breaking the glass. And that means that they are unleashing all the hounds of hell on Donald Trump, not just with regard to the criminal legal cases against him. But of course, last week, we saw an insane fine levied by Judge Arthur Engeron against Donald Trump's business, the Trump Organization. This is an insane judgment. Okay, this judgment is $354 million in damages. So just to recap what this case was, the accusation by Attorney General of the state of New York, Letitia James, was that Donald Trump fraudulently inflated his real estate holdings in an attempt to gain loans from private actors. There is no allegation that Donald Trump did not pay back those loans. There is no allegation by the people who actually gave the loans that Donald Trump ought to be prosecuted. They don't even have a case against him because they didn't suffer any damages. This is basically the same thing as if you went to a lender and you suggested that your house was worth more than it actually was worth and they didn't bother to do an appraisal or they did an appraisal and their appraisal came back and it was kind of within margin of error or at least it was high enough that they decided, you know what, booming market will throw the the loan at you anyway. And then later the state came back at you and decided to fine you for a high multiple of whatever the loan was. According to NBC News, the judge who presided over the civil business fraud trial against Trump on Friday ordered the former president, his son's business associates and company to pay more than $350 million in damages and temporarily limited their ability to do business in New York. Engron, of course, had preset this thing. It was perfectly obvious from the get-go as soon as this trial laid out. He said Trump is guilty and it was just a question of how much money he was going to force Trump to pay. According to New York Attorney General Letitia James, they said that with pre-judgment interest, that judgment totals over $450 million dollars. And in order for Trump to appeal, he has to come up with that money. That's the way the process works in New York. It is not as though you get to hold that money in abeyance pending an appeal. An appeal, you would imagine, would end with the overturning of this particular insane verdict. And remember, no damages were alleged. This is a bizarre statute in which the state of New York can charge you with fraud, not criminally, civilly, which requires a different standard of evidence. Criminally is beyond a reasonable doubt. Civilly is preponderance of the evidence, which means they just have to show by like a majority of the evidence that Donald Trump was fraudulent about his real estate holdings. And then they can fine him $450 million based on zero damages, which is obviously an attempt to bankrupt him. It's obviously an attempt to make him non-liquid in advance of the election, make him liquidate his assets, creating another bunch of headlines, create lack of cash flow for him so he can't actually defend himself in criminal cases around the country. It's an absurd, absurd attempt. What should be an illegal attempt We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, I've been talking about my Helix mattress for years. I've had that Helix Sleep mattress for, I don't know, a decade at this point. It's the gift that keeps on giving. So I have a lot of issues that keep me from sleeping, namely four small children. And every night when I get into bed, I need to fall asleep right away, which is why I really appreciate my Helix mattress. You will too. Go check out their Helix Elite collection. Helix harnesses years of extensive mattress expertise to offer a truly elevated sleep experience. That Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, well, you don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? I took that Helix quiz. I was matched with a firm but breathable mattress. Plus, Helix has a 10-year warranty. You can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. 
but you're going to love it. Their financing options, flexible payment plans, make it really easy. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders, plus a free bedroom bundle for my listeners in honor of President's Day yesterday. That bundle includes two free pillows, a set of sheets, a mattress protector. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Use code HELIXPARTNER25. It's the best offer yet. Check them out. Helixsleep.com slash Ben. Use code HELIXPARTNER25. The ruling also bars Trump and his company from even applying for any bank loans for, for three years. So he can't even get a bond for this thing. Right? Normal, first of all, who's going to give a bond in the, the amount of $450 million? Normally, when you, you know, get charged with something or you have to come up with the money and you go get a bond, the bond is repayable in a certain period of time. And you're talking about, you know, 10 grand. You're not talking about $450 million when your entire business organization has been voided for doing business in its home state for three years, which means he's going to have to come up with a bunch of money, obviously. Angron also ordered the continued appointment of an independent monitor and the installation of an independent director of compliance for the company. Trump called it an illegal un-American judgment against me, my family, and my tremendous business. He said the decision is a complete and total sham. That, of course, is true. His sons were also ordered to pay $4 million apiece. It also bars them from running the company. That's obviously what this is about. And by the way, this is stacked atop the judgment in favor of E. Jean Carroll, the least credible witness of all time, probably, in the amount of $83 million. So civil trials where Donald Trump now owes money amount to well over half a billion dollars. All of that initiated since he lost the presidency in November of 2020. This is, of course, an insane judgment. It is clearly political. As the Wall Street Journal editorial board points out, they say, This is like using a Hellfire missile to annihilate a shoplifter. There was no real financial victim. Letitia James campaigned for office promising to find Trump guilty of something. Okay, well, this is initiating a lot of angst and some blowback. So there are a a bunch of people who are suggesting that they're going to initiate travel boycotts of New York. There was a call by one person online for an attempt by truckers not to ship their goods into the city of New York. That seems to have fallen apart. Here, this, this person calls himself Chicago Ray. He put this up and went viral over the weekend. Here he was. I took down that video that I posted on Friday uh, because it went viral, went on TikTok. Not because I don't stand by what I said, because I do, but, you know, my grandson's seen it and, you know, he got a little hurt by it and it hurt my feelings. So, you know, what the f- you know, that's it. It is what it is. Um, I'm not no, look, I'm not no figurehead here. I'm not no uh, leader of any movement. I'm not going on any podcasts or, you know, doing any GoFundMe's or anything like that. You know, I'm who I am. All right. I hear chatter. I let you guys know what I heard. And, you know, that's what it is. I'm just saying I stand with Trump. Okay. I'm, I'm one of the millions of truckers that stand with Trump. That's it. Okay. So will there be civil disobedience? I mean, he says no, right? But you could see something more likely what you're going to see happening is every business person in New York who's remotely affiliated with any Republican position is going to pull their money. If you are living in New York right now and you are affiliated with the Trump campaign in any way, if you gave money to the Trump campaign, you're going to rush down to Florida as fast as humanly possible. You're about to see a money drain in the state of New York. That is going to make the last few years pale in comparison, because if you believe that you can live in New York and not have your property expropriated by a judge for what is kind of normal real estate business wheeling and dealing that operates around the edges in New York, and let's be real about how real estate operates in New York, why exactly would you stick around in New York for all of that? Meanwhile, federal agencies, the so-called deep state, they are attempting to insulate their own regulations against the possibility that Trump becomes president again. Now, this is the problem with the bureaucratic state initiated by Woodrow Wilson, is you have basically an independent body of regulators who work for the Democratic Party and who are just going to ignore whatever Trump tries to do. Now, what Trump is pledging to do is he's pledging to bring them under the umbrella of federal law that allows him to fire people, and he totally should. He absolutely should. If he becomes president of the United States, regulators who are attempting to enshrine in law permanently regulations that outlive Joe Biden, those people should be fired immediately. Donald Trump is right about that, but they're doing their damnedest to try and thwart Trump should he become president. According to Politico, President Joe Biden's allies are getting antsy about his administration's pileup of unfinished environmental rules. Biden's agencies are facing a deadline this spring to finish some of their most important regulations to ensure a Republican Congress and White House cannot erase them next year. 
Complicating matters is the fact that the deadline won't be known until months after the rules are completed. Now, how is that even legal? How is it legal for them to write regulations that are unrepealable by Congress and the president of the United States? Is there, in, is there an independent body in the Constitution of the United States that is allowed to create review-free regulations that bind all of us without the input of, you know, their boss, the president, or their boss, the Congress? That's insane. But they're openly reporting that the regulatory state is attempting to enshrine in law all of these regulations to avoid Donald Trump's presidency. That's what they're attempting to do, again, because this is a fight against evil, according to these people, and they will use any means at their disposal. Meanwhile, obviously, on the foreign front, things are falling into absolute sheer chaos. And it's chaos on all sides, and it's really quite hideous. So Donald Trump put out a statement over the weekend on the death of Navalny, Alexei Navalny. So Alexei Navalny, of course, was almost certainly murdered by the Kremlin. He was, after he was attempted, they, they tried to kill him back in 2021. When they tried to kill him and failed, then they then arrested him. He came back to Russia. They arrested him immediately. They gave him a 30-year sentence. They sent him to the Gulag, and then they almost certainly murdered him. In the, the, the contemporaneous reports coming out suggest that Navalny's had body had signs of bruising. This is according to Metro UK. Several officers from the FSB, that's Russia's intelligence service, which is the heir to the KGB, visited the Polar Wolf prison camp earlier this week, according to activists at the human rights group Galagu.net, before the opposition figure dropped dead, aged 47, on Friday. The organization claimed CCTV cameras were shut off at the complex in the hours before his death, as well as suggesting the speed at which the authorities made comments on the incident was deeply suspicious. A well-prepared statement, likened by the organization to a press release, was issued by the prison two minutes after his death was supposed to have taken place. Two minutes. And seven minutes later, the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, was addressing the country's press. And that is not what happens after a person dies of natural causes. It doesn't take the government two minutes to announce his death. It's more on this in just one second. First, no one likes to talk about life insurance, but it is really, really important. You need to include it in your financial planning for this year. Start shopping right now with Policy Genius. Find the right policy to protect your family today. Give yourself the peace of mind that comes with knowing that if something were to happen to you, your family can cover all their expenses while getting back on their feet. Policy Genius's technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. You already have a life insurance policy through work, but that might not actually offer enough protection for your family. And if you leave your job, it might not follow you, which is why you need a backup plan. And that's where Policy Genius comes in. You can find life insurance policies starting at just $292 per year for a million dollars in coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. When they make it this easy, you should just get it done. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance company, so they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another. You can trust their guidance. Save time and money. Give your family that financial safety net with Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro or click the link in the description. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. In fact, an inmate at the complex told Russian opposition media other prisoners were informed of only had died at 10 a.m., which is before the officially recorded death time of 2.17 p.m. And they described how unknown vehicles had arrived at the prison the night before. None of this should be particularly surprising because, again, just a few years ago, they attempted to poison him with a nerve agent called Novichok. Not only was this well documented, the documentary on HBO that you can watch, Navalny, actually documents Alexei Navalny literally calling up the people who tried to poison him and asking them what they did. He pretends that he's working for the government. He asks them and they just tell him straight up that they poisoned his underwear and then they hope that that would make it into his mouth like by drinking a water bottle or something. And that, that's exactly what happened. He almost died. Local paramedics have told the opposition outlet Novaya Gazeta Europa that Navalny's body is currently being held at a different facility in the same area as the prison. They still have not turned it over. They're not turning it over, presumably because there will be signs of actual murder on him. Yulia Navalny, who is his wife, she said her late husband's body is being hidden because they're waiting for traces of yet another of Putin's Novichok to disappear. Novichok is a chemical nerve agent that kills you. And then eventually the signs of it wear off in the body. The Russian government thought it had worn off in the body. And then the Germans were able to actually detect it last time they used Novichok against Navalny. OK, so Donald Trump then put out a comment on Navalny after several days of not saying anything. And he said the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what is happening in our country. It is a slow, steady progression with crooked, radical left politicians, prosecutors and judges leading us down a path to destruction. Open borders, rigged elections, grossly unfair courtroom decisions are destroying America. We are a nation in decline, a failing nation, MAGA 2024. 
Okay, so there are a few things to be said about this. One, the last half where he talks about the decline of the country and the militarization of the Justice Department, militarization of our judicial system, all of that part's true. It is totally wrong for Donald Trump to compare that to the judicial arraignment, arrest, without process, without due process, without real charges, jailing and murder of Vladimir Putin's political opponents. And it's wrong for two reasons. One, it suggests that the state of play in the United States is similar to the state of play in Russia, which degrades the United States. Things are bad in the United States. They ain't nearly as bad as they are in Russia. That is a difference in kind. And we should recognize that because, again, many of these problems are fixable with, say, elections or, say, with moving or, say, with impeachments of bad judges. Okay, the same is not true remotely in Russia. So it's, it's problematic to compare America to Russia for two reasons. One, it degrades the actual state of play in the United States. When you hear journalists traveling abroad and decrying the state of censorship in the United States in Russia, where they literally kill the dissidents. That's a bad look. It's not true. Okay. But it also happens to downgrade the scale of what's happening in Russia, the state of evil that is happening in Russia. And Vladimir Putin is, in fact, a corrupt dictator. I know this has become unpopular to say in some circles. I don't know why. You can even make the case against American involvement in Ukraine without talking up Putin. But then again, I suppose you can't because here is the thing. It is in America's interest to watch America's geopolitical rivals downgraded in terms of military capacity. It is not in America's interest to watch those geopolitical rivals gobble up large segments of the globe in terms of territory and population that have control over things like grain and oil. Making a real politic case for why the United States should basically acquiesce in Russian military land grabs that's a very difficult case to make. So the only case that you're left making is effectively that Russia is not that bad or that Ukraine is worse or whatever it is. The problem is Russia is kind of that bad. So if you want to make the case that America doesn't have a geopolitical interest in Ukraine, make that case. But many of the people who are making that case are not really making that case. They're making a broader case, which is that Russia is not that bad, that somehow Putin is a guardian of Christianity or Putin is a, is a, a defender of, of Western values against secular liberalism. That's not what Vladimir Putin is. Vladimir Putin is a proponent of Russian greatness. Russian greatness is largely based, historically speaking, on Russian land control. That has been true for literally hundreds of years. That's, by the way, Putin will say that himself in his interview with Tucker Carlson, for example. He literally spent the first 35 minutes explaining the history of, of Russia's control of land. At no point did he talk about, quote unquote, the spread of Russian values or the importance of Christianity. In fact, when Tucker tried to prompt him on that, he actually dodged the question. So let's talk about what's in America's interest at this point with regard to Russia and what, and what Russia is actually doing. So what Russia is attempting to do on a foreign policy level is sort of recreate the red-green-brown alliance. So back at the outset of World War II, there effectively was a red-green-brown alliance. And that alliance between the Nazis and the Soviets and the Islamists, because people forget about this, but the Islamists were working the entire Second World War effectively with the Nazis. Okay, so... The new attempt by Russia is to recreate that internationally and with some help from domestic friends in, in other countries. What that means is that in this particular vision, Russia actually is not red. The reds would be Marxists, people on the far left who believe that the West is a nefarious force in the world and that everything bad that's been happening in the world is some sort of weird blowback to America. And those people have advocated for America's enemies for a very, very long time. This would be like Bernie Sanders, who suggests that everything that happens in America is what's been driving places elsewhere. And we, we ought to withdraw from the world because it's better for the world for America not to be involved in other parts of the world. America's a nefarious Howard Zinn-like force in the world. They're joined by some people on the, on the right who have sort of horseshoe theoried this thing where America is really, really bad. And again, American foreign policy is responsible for all the blowback that has happened over the course of time. So you have sort of this horseshoe theory that you can put in sort of the red category. Then you have the Greens. Those would be the Islamists. Those would be people like the mullahs in Iran or Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Bashar Assad, or the Houthis. Right? Those groups are allied with the Marxists. This is why you see, say, queers for Palestine marching in the West, for example. And then you have the Browns. And the Browns would be people like Vladimir Putin, who actually is a fascist. Vladimir Putin is not a communist. His country is run like a fascist oligarchy. They have like a 13% flat tax, but in order to own property and to have your property be secure, you have to be an ally of the dictator, which is the way that it works. Over there, China, by the way, is in sort of the same category. China is sort of titularly communist, but they're more fascist than they are communist, considering that they've allowed large swaths of market activity inside the country. So they are more corporatist at this point than they are actually communist. 
So this anti-American alliance is what Vladimir Putin is actually pursuing at this point. You can see it cropping up all over the globe. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. First, our friends at ZipRecruiter conducted a recent survey. They found the top hiring challenge employers face in 2024 is a lack of qualified candidates. This is certainly true, by the way. If you're an employer and you need to hire, Great news, ZipRecruiter has smart tools and features that help you find more qualified candidates quickly. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. As soon as you post your job, ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology shows you candidates whose skills and experience match your requirements. ZipRecruiter has an invite to apply feature so you can send top candidates a personalized invite and encourage them to respond to your job post. When you use ZipRecruiter's rating tool, they'll send you more matches from new profiles created on the site. And ZipRecruiter can help you conquer your biggest hiring challenge, finding those qualified candidates. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate within day one. Just go to my exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. There is no bigger challenge for an employer than finding great employees. ZipRecruiter can help. Head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. So Russia is now forming open alliances with the far left in South America. They've been doing this for a while. This is presumably why Lula da Silva, who is supposedly the great savior of democracy, according to the American left in Brazil, over the weekend, he literally said on Navalny's death, quote, I'm not going to jump to conclusions. Let's see what the doctors say. Was the citizen sick? It's like the case of the passenger who died on the plane coming to Ethiopia. Who are we going to blame? So Lula is covering for Navalny at the same exact time, by the way. He's also covering for Hamas. We should point that out. In fact, over the weekend, Lula said that Israel was like Hitler and came out in full scale defense of Hamas. Here he was over the weekend. And by the way, they've now withdrawn their ambassador, Brazil has, from Israel. Here he is. He said what is happening in the Gaza Strip and with the Palestinian people does not exist at any other historical moment. In fact, it existed when Hitler decided to kill the Jews. So full-scale anti-Semitic language here, right? The idea is that the Jews are the new Hitlers and the Palestinians who initiated the murderous rage fest in which they killed 1,200 Israeli citizens. They're still holding 100 Israeli citizens underground in Gaza right now. Hamas could surrender tomorrow. They are not, obviously. Lula is upholding the alliance with Hamas, with Palestinian Islamic Jihad, with the radical Islamists, with the Greens, because he is, in fact, a red, and he's making common cause with people like Vladimir Putin, who really isn't the red anymore. He's more of a brown. Vladimir Putin, because he's kind of a fascist. And when I say kind of, I mean he has complete governmental control of literally every aspect of his society and is not fully a communist, right? He lets the oligarchs keep their money so long as they serve his interests. And you've seen this alliance grow. It's, it's, it's a very problematic alliance for the United States. Because again, Russia now controls large segments of the Middle East. They have an alliance with Iran, for example. They have an alliance with Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Over the weekend, in fact, Hamas was invited by Russia to visit. According to the Jerusalem Post, Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Shtaya said over the weekend, Russia invited Palestinian factions to meet in Moscow at some point in late February. Moscow has already hosted a Hamas delegation in October. In October, that Hamas delegation, which was led by senior Hamas member Musa Abu Marzuk, met with the Russian and Iranian deputy foreign ministers, Mikhail Bogdanov and Ali Bagheri Khani. That meeting represented a convening of interest between Russia, Iran, and Hamas. The relationship between Russia and terrorist groups in the Middle East is quite real, obviously. And then you have the left in Europe, which is backing those interests as well. So, for example, you have Joseph Borrell, who's the head of EU foreign policy, who says that Israel should stop attacking Hamas now because Hamas is really more of an idea as opposed to, you know, a terror group. He said, quote, Hamas is an idea. You don't kill an idea. You have to provide an alternative that's better, which, of course, is absurd. I mean, Nazism was also an idea. And then America and its allies killed a bleep load of Nazis, obviously. Meanwhile, Iran is on the move as well. So over the weekend, Iran actually destroyed the Houthis, which are an Iranian offshoot sank a British ship in the Red Sea. According to Ynet News, the UK's Maritime Trade Operations Agency reported on Monday the Houthis sunk a ship traveling in the Red Sea south of the port city of Mucha in Yemen. It's the first time since Israel's war on Hamas that a crew had to abandon their ship because of the Houthis. Meanwhile, by the way, the United States had to strike five Houthi targets in Yemen, including an underwater drone. That technology is coming from the Iranians, who, of course, are working with the Russians. According to the New York Times, The United States struck five Houthi military targets, including an undersea drone in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen on Saturday, according to the U.S. military. 
That was the first time Iran-backed Houthis had employed such a weapon since they began their campaign against ships in the Red Sea. It was an unmanned underwater vessel. But the Houthis are receiving much of the technology directly from Iran, of course. The formation of this entire coalition, which has happened under the auspices of Joe Biden, is incredibly dangerous to America's interests. The solution to that is not to downplay what Russia is in the world. The solution to that is to face up to what Russia is in the world and to muscularly protect America's interests around the globe. That doesn't mean war everywhere. It does mean that America does certainly have an interest in, say, free shipping across the world. Whatever the cost is of the Ukraine war, it is significantly less than what happens if freedom of the seas decreases to the point where every ship is avoiding the Red Sea and the Suez Canal completely. We'll get to more on this in just one second. Right now is your chance to get 30% off Daily Wire Plus annual memberships during our President's Day sale when you use code DW30 at checkout. Your Daily Wire Plus membership is your backstage pass to conversations with the smartest and most trusted talented in America. It's your front row seat to the Daily Wire's upcoming hit movies and series like The Pendragon Cycle, Mr. Bertram, and more. It's your inside access to ad-free, uncensored news and opinions that matter to you. You get it all and so much more with your Daily Wire Plus membership. Right now, it's 30% off during our President's Day sale. Head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code DW30 at checkout. Meanwhile, of course, all of this was led off by the American surrender in Afghanistan to the 8th century thugs who were the Taliban. And now, as it turns out, unsurprisingly, remember that time that Joe Biden said that al-Qaeda would never be in Afghanistan again, that we had achieved our purposes? Uh, spoiler alert, they're in Afghanistan again. According to the Jerusalem Post, the al-Qaeda terrorist organization is having a resurgence in Afghanistan under the ruling Taliban, setting up eight new training camps alongside five madrasas, Islamic educational institutions around the country. That is a report from the UN Security Council from late January. The report said the training camps are located in various provinces, including Ghazni, Lachman, Parwan, and Uruzgan. It also listed sites used by al-Qaeda to move its operatives in and out of neighboring Iran and said that a new base to stockpile weaponry has been established in the Panjshir Valley, north of the capital of Kabul. Again, what we are watching in real time is a, an alliance of convenience between Russia and China, and it's including Iran. And those countries are seeking to make common cause with left-wing countries in South America and in Africa as well to create effectively an anti-American bloc. That is what is happening in real time. And that's been led off by the era of Joe Biden surrender laden politics. There's a lot of attempt here, by the way, to pass this off as a result of Trump. But let's be real about this. Iran was fairly contained while Donald Trump was president of the United States. They were quite fearful. Russia was fairly contained while Donald Trump was president of the United States. They were fearful, if not of his rhetoric, then of his unpredictability. China was not exactly certain what Donald Trump was going to do, but they are perfectly certain of what Joe Biden is going to do. And that is put up a soft show of force, slow walk aid to America's allies, vacillate because the Democratic Party is vacillating. This is why when Joe Biden tries to suggest, for example, that the blood of Alexei Navalny is on the hands of Republicans, that's an amazing statement. He's the current president of the United States. If the president gets the credit or blame for what happens while he's president. I noticed that this old dude is the current president of the United States. Here he was over the weekend. Would you go as far as to say that Alexei Navalny's blood is on the hands of House Republicans right now? I didn't mean that they're making a big mistake not his Look. He said, I wouldn't use that term, but they're making a big mistake not responding, says Joe Biden. Well, I noticed that you said that you were going to have harsh response for Navalny if he died. That's something that Joe Biden said. When Navalny returned to Russia and then Navalny was immediately arrested and gulagged, Joe Biden said there would be significant repercussions for Russia should that happen, should Navalny be murdered. Well, now Navalny's been murdered and Joe Biden ain't doing bleep. But again, this is a broad scale problem for the United States and it is a conflict of vision with regard to foreign policy. I would say the foreign policy debate in the United States breaks down into at least four camps. First, there are the neocons who have sort of an outsized role in the American imagination because of the war in Iraq. The neocons essentially made the argument, the Wilsonian argument, that it was America's job to preserve and foster democracy everywhere on earth, regardless as to whether it was in America's direct or indirect interest. That effectively, American values had to be spread no matter what, and that the safest world was a world in which American values predominated, even in places that were very unfriendly to American values. That school of thought has basically gone by the wayside. And anybody who says the word neocon right now with regard to the vast majority of politicians is, is just talking nonsense. The vast majority of politicians, even on the on the sort of hawkish right, were not in favor, for example, of the war in Libya or direct American involvement in Syria. And many of them are not in favor of, for example, heavy involvement even in Ukraine today. So, again, the, the sort of neocon idea was thoroughly defeated by Donald Trump in 2016 and was rather significantly discredited by the war in Iraq. 
So that that school of thought, I would say, has been largely marginalized. Then there is the sort of real politique school of thought, which is there are certain conflicts in which America does have an interest. And that doesn't mean boots on the ground. It means sometimes money. It means sometimes boots on the ground, depending on just how strong those interests are. But America does, in fact, have foreign interests, and America must apply its leverage in strategic ways in order to achieve those interests. That means getting involved in some conflicts with money, say funding Ukraine to stop Russia from taking over Kiev, but not necessarily throwing money down the rat hole of attempting to have them take over Crimea, which is not going to happen, for example. I would count myself in the real politic camp of American foreign policy. So those are two groups. Then you have the isolationists. Isolationists sort of suggest that America has no interest in what goes on around the world, what's happening anywhere. That America's interests are simply domestic and that any dollar that is spent outside of America's borders is therefore a bad dollar. I think this is short-sighted and wrong, but you understand the, the tendency. It's short-sighted in the sense that America actually does have a very strong interest in, for example, freedom of the seas. America has an incredibly strong interest in how, for example, oil flows around the globe. That does affect American citizens. America does, in fact, have a very strong interest in American allies being prevented from falling or being destroyed or being significantly harmed because those allies are the ones who are going to come to our defense if, God forbid, there were an attack on the United States. There are a bunch of foreign interests that exist. I think the isolationist position is untenable. And when people suggest that it's somehow immoral, that foreign aid in general is immoral, I just wonder what they would have said about the Marshall Plan. Was the Marshall Plan immoral? The Marshall Plan literally rebuilt all of Western Europe. If it had not happened, then the Soviets would have taken all of Western Europe. Would that have been fine also? I assume the answer is yes. I think that's incredibly short-sighted. But that isolationist wing is a, is a third wing. And then there's the fourth horseshoe theory wing of foreign policy. And the horseshoe theory wing is occupied by an increasingly large segment of the left and shockingly in a small but increasingly large segment of the right. And that horseshoe theory wing is not isolationist in the sense that it's just not in America's interest to be involved in foreign policy. It's the idea that America itself is deeply flawed and bad and that every act that happens abroad is a result of the evils of the United States, of, of past American interventionism, of America's foreign interests, and that America should retreat from the world, not because it's in America's interest to do so, but because it's in the world's interest for America to do so. And that theory involves the propping up of terrible dictators. It involves the leaving in power of some of the world's worst people. It involves leaving allies out to dry, right? That sort of stuff is the fourth wing of American politics. And the problem that we are seeing right now is a conflation of various wings of American politics on all sides of the, of the various aisles. So, let us be clear. When it comes to Joe Biden's foreign policy, Joe Biden's foreign policy vacillates between sort of what he thinks is the real politic and the horseshoe theory. It vacillates strongly between those two poles because that's where the Democratic Party is split. Between the real politic, there's some Democrats who still understand that America has foreign interests. And those Democrats, for example, support foreign aid to Ukraine and Israel by and large. And then you have the Democratic wing that is sort of the radical young people who believe that America is bad and terrible in the world and basically should revert to its own borders and then open those borders. And that wing is very prominent. That's the Rashida Tlaib wing of the Democratic Party. That is a very real wing. And so you've seen the Biden administration, because Joe Biden can't actually bridge that gap, vacillating between the two positions wildly. And that has led the rest of the world to conclude that America is, in fact, quite weak. And the rest of the world is not necessarily wrong on that score. Meanwhile, as far as the Republicans, who Joe Biden is blaming for all of this, it's unclear exactly what the Republican Party is doing at this point because the Republican Party has laid out various different views of its own on exactly what American foreign policy should look like. And you actually have members of probably all four wings of the foreign policy establishment that I just described in the Republican Party. You have members of like two wings in the Democratic Party, and you have members of probably all four wings in the Republican Party. You have a small niche sort of neocon wing, a very large real politique wing, you have a, a, a small but growing isolationist wing, and you have an even smaller but still growing wing of horseshoe theory, folks. And the Republican Party is split between all of those, which leads to a very confused and confusing take on what foreign policy ought to be. So it's unclear exactly what's going to happen in the House of Representatives. All I would say is, is it in America's interest for Russia to take Ukraine whole? Not for Russia to maintain the Donbass or Crimea and end the war. I think everybody, if they could make that deal happen, who's of rational mind, wants that deal to happen. The question is whether Vladimir Putin wants that deal to happen. I see no indicators at this point that he does. He believes the West is going to collapse. Why does he believe that? Well, maybe because of Afghanistan, maybe because of Vietnam, maybe because of Iraq, maybe because every major foreign policy commitment that the West has made over the course of the last 40 years, certainly since the end of the Cold War, has largely ended with the West retreating to its own borders and nefarious powers taking 
territory, whether you're talking about Hong Kong or you're talking about Afghanistan. So Vladimir Putin is simply playing for time. Meanwhile, again, the Republicans are very split on this sort of stuff. They're not sure exactly what to do. Representative Mike Turner, who's the head of the House Intelligence Committee of Ohio, he says that, that right now the House Speaker is trying to clear a path for Ukraine aid, but having a tough time of it. As you know, President Zelensky has been asking for this aid since October for five months now. Has Speaker Johnson given you any assurances that he is going to bring Ukraine aid to the floor? Well, President Johnson has made a number of public statements committing uh, to finding a pathway for the aid for Ukraine. Uh, I believe him. I think that we will. Uh, and this does need to get done. This is absolutely critical for U.S. support uh, for Ukraine and to oppose Russian aggression. I mean, we will find out. But one of the big problems, of course, is that because all the parties are split along various lines, it's not even clear what people want from Ukraine. So according to Politico, people in Munich, there's a Munich security conference. And a bunch of people showed up from various countries. Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia and chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, said that the aid package being considered would be, quote unquote, a game changer for Ukraine. But he did not make clear exactly what victory even looked like. He declined to say that the support would ensure Ukrainian triumph. Instead, he just said that it was sort of the last hope. It's unclear exactly what's going to happen in Ukraine. And this is part of the problem. Joe Biden has not even articulated what an end looks like in Ukraine. It's why you're seeing the rising isolationist and horseshoe theory wing. Because you do, in fact, have to tell your own citizens what the hell your plans are when you spend significant amounts of foreign aid abroad. Even if you want to say, as I would say, that we are better off funding Ukraine to stave off a Russian taking of Kiev with the less than 1% of money that we spend on our federal budget every year and a fairly insignificant percentage even of our defense budget to basically restock our shelves, grease the wheels in terms of getting our military production capacity up to, up to snuff, Right. Even if you want to make that argument, make the argument. Nobody's making any of these arguments. And it's truly annoying to me. Meanwhile, China, of course, is seeing a bunch of weakness. According to The Wall Street Journal, the Chinese military had a giant military exercise about three months ago in the South China Sea, in the Philippine Sea, actually. The Philippine Sea, which is a swath of the Pacific Ocean east of Taiwan, was the site, site of a decisive aircraft carrier battle in World War II between the United States and Japan. And carriers are now once again, gathering there, and for good reason. Control of the Philippine Sea would be prized in any conflict between the China and the United States over Taiwan or the South China Sea. U.S. warships, troops, and supplies deployed from bases on Guam or Hawaii would likely need to transit through that area, and China would want to interrupt those flows. You are seeing the Chinese attempting to take control of that particular location. In October of 2023, Chinese aircraft carrier and four other warships did a drill there. In September, they did another drill in this particular area. In January, the United States held a drill there. And vacillation at home leads to foreign aggression. Vladimir Lenin famously suggested that his foreign policy was probe with bayonets, push where there's mush. America's enemies know that, and they are seeing an awful lot of mush at this point. Okay, meanwhile, on the American domestic front, America's racial problems continue to be seen in the halls of woke academia. There's an amazing interview that was done with the free press by Roland Fryer. Roland Fryer is a Harvard professor who became the youngest black person ever to be awarded tenure at an Ivy League school at the age of 30. He says that he faces threats and had to get armed security after he published a study in 2016 showing no racial bias in police-involved shootings. In fact, his research found that officers were less likely to shoot black people than at white people in similar situations, although the difference was not statistically significant, as the Epic Times points out. He said, I let the data talk and I don't care what it cost. But then apparently... He told Barry Weiss, who's the editor of the Free Press and the founder of it, he told her that he expected his research to show different conclusions. But when the research showed no bias in police-involved shootings, he hired a new team of assistants and repeated the exact same study. The results were the same. His Harvard colleagues told him not to publish because they were worried that he would ruin his career. He did run it, and in fact, it did ruin his career. Former Harvard president Claudine Gay alleged that Fryer's conduct with regard to one of his AIDS exhibited a pattern of behavior that failed to meet expectations and he was suspended from Harvard two years after being accused of engaging in, quote, unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature. He denied all of that, obviously. Here is uh, Roland Fryer discussing with Barry Weiss what it means to cross the establishment at one of these universities. 
One of the details in this story is that you were suspended by a woman who I had never heard of until recently. Her name is Claudine Gay. And she said this in a letter to the economics department at the time. Professor Fryer exhibited a pattern of behavior that failed to meet the expectations of conduct within our community and was harmful to the well-being of its members. The totality of these behaviors is a clear violation of institutional norms and a betrayal of trust of the Harvard community. So I guess I want to ask, do you believe in karma? I hear it's a m <laughs> And also, does calling for the genocide of Jews constitute bullying and harassment? Yes or no? Uh, a thousand percent. Now, again, the fact that that is hard to say at Harvard University, but get rid of Roland Fryer was very easy to say at Harvard University, is demonstrative of where our racial politics currently stands. You know, over the weekend, Joy Reid had herself a, uh, a sane and solid day. She suggested that she deserves reparations, did Joy Reid. Um, which is weird since her parents are immigrants to the country and are not, in fact, American descendants of, of slaves. Here was Joy Reid talking about race in America. To be a, a black person in, you know, 2024 in America is to be in a state of complete perplexed confusion about what is wrong with a country that hates your history, to this day can't admit even the basics of what was done to your ancestors can't accept any responsibility for the lack that has carried through the entirety of the existence of you in this country and think 60 years of relative freedom is enough. And to find out that literally Barack Obama's two terms in pre as president are your reparations and Juneteenth, which you already celebrated anyway, is your reparations. And yet you built this country. You literally physically built this country and yet the attitude toward you from a lot of your peers and your fellow citizens is just shut up and be grateful. Okay, so uh, let's be clear about Joy Reid. She did not physically build this country. In fact, nobody of this generation has physically built this country <laughs> to be realistic. You're talking about whether, in fact, slaves were the predominant drivers of the American economy in the antebellum era. And uh, there's some pretty hotly fought economic debate over this. The typical answer is no, actually, slavery is a drag on economic productivity pretty much everywhere that it is practiced. But put aside that entire argument, Joy Reid saying this, talking about how it's very difficult to be Joy Reid is pretty astonishing, considering, again, her dad is from Congo and her mom is from Guyana. And uh, and she is a multimillionaire. But this is the state of our racial discourse in the United States. All righty, folks, coming up, we are going to get into to science, some new scientific discoveries that are shocking in the extreme. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.